sharing. So again, this is Alex Austin. He's at NASA JPL and he is going to um, give us an overview of the study. Okay, thank you, Jamie. Um, so uh, thanks for the introduction. I'm really excited to, to be here. I'm glad that the results of this study are, are gonna be useful. Um, this is something that we worked on back in 2019, seems like ages ago now, um, but uh, uh, still re very relevant today. Um, so um, I, my name is Alex, I'm from JPL, but uh, the study I'm gonna present to you on involved a very large team from across NASA, um, academia and industry. Uh, you'll see the list of folks here on the first slide, and um, I'm sure that many of these names uh, uh, you can recognize. So um, this study was RLSO2, uh, Robotic Lunar Surface Operations 2. Um, and you know, you probably ask, well, why? what's the number two mean? And that's because uh, there was actually an RLSO1 uh, back in 1989. So this was a, a Boeing study that was done uh, for NASA Ames Research Center. Um, and this study uh, was a little bit different than what we tackled in RLSO2. They were focused on the equatorial regions doing ISRU uh, with uh, ilmenite as the um, main source of, 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 uh, of, of the propellant that they were making. Um, but what, we, what they really did in this study is they took a, a systems view. Um, and we wanted to repeat this given all of the interest in the, in the South Pole and the water ice that's there um, and not design in incredible detail, every single element of the base, but take a look at what are the architectures, what are the types of elements that are needed, what's the kind of scale that we're probably looking at, and kind of inform those types of things. So then when we come to workshops like this, we have those architectures, we have those general elements so that we can really start to talk about the details. So um, the goals of our study uh, for RLSO2 were, um, as I said, to build this kind of overall understanding of the architecture of a sustainable base, that's a keyword sustainable, um, with ISRU for the production of propellant, in this case, uh, water ice to make liquid oxygen, and liquid hydrogen, um, and then provide some quantitative comparisons of different architecture options for things like required total mass, required power. Um, so, uh, as I said, we came in with the initial assumption of the South Pole. You'll see that this is around Shackleton, although, um, as we know, there's multiple regions that this could be at the South Pole. Um, we wanted to support a crew of four for at least 30 day stays four times a year. So you'll see that kind of built into the overall architecture, the size of the habitat and what needs to be supported. Um, we assumed Lunar Gateway as the staging point. Um, so that informed things like required delta Vs to get from Earth to the moon and back. Um, and we focused first on establishing the ISRU capability, but with an eye towards expansion, um, you know, to, to, to do other things like science and exploration. So the first thing I wanted to point out is this, you know, this idea of systems thinking, which is, is really important. And you know, there's systems thinking within elements, but then there's systems thinking at the architecture level of the whole base. Um, so what we did as part of this study is we built a model that allows us to connect these major elements together. I um, mean, you'll see those here, you know, there's environmental parameters, there's the ISRU system, there's the energy system, there's the flight system. So this is the lander that actually transports everything to and from the surface. There's the base that holds the astronauts and um, gives them all the resources that they need. And all of these things are connected, right? If you have a larger lander, then you're gonna need more propellant. So you need more ISRU to um, uh, get the propellant for that lander. That's gonna require more power. This is all connected, right? And by building this model that connects the major elements, we are able to do some quantitative analysis of what types of architectures might make the most sense. And you'll see some of those results in the future slides. So the first thing I wanted to um, highlight is, you know, when we say ISRU of water ice, what do we actually mean? Um, we uh, determined, and uh, of, of course, this is a, an area that there's been lots of research and work in, um, that there's six main steps of ISRU in this case. You have to excavate the regolith, you have to transport that regolith to a place where you can then extract volatiles. Um, but there's not just water, there's a lot of other stuff uh, in those volatiles that you extract as well. So you have to purify it to get to water, which you then can use electrolysis to split into hydrogen and oxygen, which you'll then use for propellant. You then have to liquefy and store it. Um, and these were kind of the six main steps that we uh, wanted to 
take a closer look at and what kind of elements would be needed for these. So um, with any kind of mining operation, the first thing you have to spell out is what, uh, what your resource actually is. Um, this table comes from uh, uh, Anthony Kolopreet from NASA Ames. Um, and uh, he took a look at what, given our best guess at this point, I mean, given what we know, obviously things like Viper are gonna be really important to refine these numbers. What are we thinking is likely the resource that we're going to be seeing? Um, so you see the, um, the picture up at the top, uh, this is this is actually Hermite Crater on the lunar North Pole, but it's illustrative. Um, it's color coded, so the red colors that's PSR, so that's permanently shadowed. So that's where we have a very stable um, water ice resource. Oh, the lights just went off here. Uh, one sec, let me turn the lights on. <laughs> All right. Um, and uh, so in this case, we estimated that there'd be a two percent water concentration. Um, and that that would be not stable all the way at the surface. So you have to dig down a little bit, about 20 centimeters to get to it. Um, and that means that you're getting about 7.2 kilograms of water per meter cubed of regolith. Um, as you work your way into the other regions, you're getting into areas that see more and more sunlight. Um, you know, type four is basically you're seeing sun um, very, very often. You know, uh, type three and two are seeing less sun um, type one is the PSR. And as you see more sun, you start to lose the volatiles. Um, so basically, you know, in PSRs, the resource is best. You know, that's where the most water is. Um, but you'll see that it's also hard to operate inside a permanently shadowed region. So what are the main elements that we determined would be part of, of, a, of a lunar base? Um, so I'll go into a little bit more detail about some of these elements, but you need an energy system that provides power. Um, in our case, we ended up settling on a solar power system. Um, you need a lot of power. Uh, we needed over 500 kilowatts capacity, and I'll show you some more numbers in a future slide. Um, you need a habitat for the astronauts. Um, one thing we determined is that, I mean, in addition to wanting astronauts to go to the moon for exploration initiatives, um, they're going to be needed to repair and keep things operating. Um, so they actually have a job. They have a really important job um, with the ISRU base as well to keep everything operating. Um, you're going to need robots to do construction of the base, maintenance of the base, and then you're going to need your ISRU systems. You're going to need something that allows you to mine the regolith, something to extract the volatiles off of it, something to process it, electrolyze it, turn it into oxygen and hydrogen, liquefy it and store it. And then finally, you need some kind of transportation system, a lander that allows you to go to and from the surface. So we took a look at all these elements, again, kind of at a high level, an architectural level. Um, I'll talk a little bit more about some of those. But what was really important is the um, idea, again, going back to that systems view of really designing all these elements concurrently. Um, it was very important to us that all of these things were connected so they could operate together. So you'll see here, for instance, we have this lander down in the uh, lower right-hand corner, and then there's this gantry system. And that gantry system was designed so that it could drive over the lander to offload things. And then you'll see that the habitat is housed in a tunnel, um, which uh, has shielding via regolith to protect the astronauts from radiation. And you'll see that that gantry system is also designed to fit into that tunnel. So it was very important that we design all of these things concurrently so that we don't end up with these disjointed elements that can't work together. Um, and I think that's a really important conclusion that we wanna carry forward with the type of uh, work that we're doing to try to you know, really push these exploration initiatives forward. Okay, so a little bit more detail on the lander. Um, so uh, we ended up requiring about 30 metric ton uh, payload capacity. So that's bringing 30 metric tons um, from Gateway down to the surface. That's driven by the equipment and things that we had to bring down for ISRU as well as the habitat. Um, obviously we, you know, we're, we're oxygen hydrogen because we wanted to be uh, as sustainable as possible, not have to bring anything from earth. Um, we had a single stage system, um, which is very challenging um, uh, because of all the extra dry mass of the lander. But again, with that eye to sustainability and maximum reusability, that was the system that you know, we weren't having to deal with any stages or anything. So that's really what we tried to push towards. Um, and you'll see that we had those side slung tanks that allow us to offload equipment lower to the ground. Um, so you'll see it's a, it's a very big lander. I mean, that's required for something this large, uh, about 15 by 12 meters. Um, so this is a very large system. Here's that mobile gantry. So this was one of the most important elements of the base. 
Um, this was kind of our, our Swiss Army knife. Um, that gantry uh, had multiple different tools, multiple different um, interchangeable end effectors for robotic arms to perform base site excavation, preparation, construction. Um, this was a uh, the most critical kind of overall element that really did the most across the entire base. Um, it was fuel cell powered, uh, again, with that eye towards this kind of water economy where we're going to have all this water, so let's use fuel cells. Um, and we had uh, two units that were able to drive over the lander. You'll see a graphic here of how that would work. Uh, they would drive over the, the lander with those side slung tanks. They'd be able to lift heavy things off with winches and then uh, bring them to different places around the base. Um, so the habitat, uh, again, this was initially sized for four astronauts uh, um, for 30 day stays four times a year. So this is really the minimum, the minimal habitat. Um, there's a uh, habitat module uh, for them to live in. There's a logistics module that would have to be replaced with their consumables. Um, and then there's a, a, uh, a workshop and that workshop is really important because that is uh, where they can actually perform repairs and maintenance on the equipment. Um, you know, we determined that we didn't think robots could, could do it all. You, know, there's, you have to get an astronaut sometime that can take some things apart and solder some, some things together, just as an example. Um, and uh, we weren't able to find a way for robots to do all of that. You know, we really need the humans to come and, and to help maintain the space. Um, You'll see here that tunnel structure that I mentioned. Uh, that's a deployable tunnel um, with a regolith to protect from radiation. Um, and again, with that eye towards expandability, we tried to design this in such a way that you could add to this habitat later. Um, you could add a science lab or, or other types of modules once you get the base up and running. So just a little bit more kind of a note on that idea of robotic maintenance. So. Um, Again, you we, we determined that you really need the astronauts to be able to perform some maintenance functions. Um, so I think that that might be something to talk about in the panels around, uh, um, you know, how much maintenance is required in these extreme environments. Um, so we designed the gantry in such a way that it could remove um, subsystems of the larger systems. It could bring those through an airlock for the astronauts to work on them in a, in a shirt sleeve environment. Um, and minimize the number of EVAs that the astronauts would have to do. So you see a graphic here of the gantry bringing something up through the airlock into the workshop uh, where it can uh, be transferred and, and worked on by the astronauts. So let's talk a little bit more about the architectures that we considered. Um, you saw these pictures in the introduction slides, um, but I'll go into a little bit more detail. Um, we ended up uh, looking at three base options. Um, all of them were located around Shackleton Crater. Um, and they varied based on the location of those different elements and uh, where they were in relation to each other. So the first option is kind of uh, the classical permanently shadowed region base. Um, all of the elements are down in the PSR, um, except for the solar rays, which are along the rim of the crater where they can see sunlight almost all the time. Um, the advantage to this is that your base is located right in the place where the best resource is. So remember that uh, the best resource is down in the PSR. So everything's right there. You just have to go outside and you can go and there's the best resource. The challenge is that power has to be transferred into the PSR. Um, we talked about different ways to do that, running large cables. Ultimately, uh, given how Shackleton has the, the, is so deep with such deep walls, um, we ended up determining that we would take a look at laser power beaming. So we have these laser power beaming systems that beam power into the PSR. We go, we have an excavator system that can pick up the regolith. It brings it to um, an extraction system that makes the volatiles. Or that goes into a purification system, an electrolysis system, ultimately stores it all. Um, and that is used for our lander. So this was base option one. In base option two, what we did is we're, we decided we, so we're still mining the resource down in the PSR, but in this case, we moved everything except for the excavation step up out of the crater. So this means that now we do have to traverse in and out of the, of the crater. Um, I'm not sure that we would wanna do this at Shackleton. There are easier to access PSRs. Um, that traverse is very challenging, but the benefit now is that 
the things that take a lot of power, the electrolysis, the things that take a lot of power are now located right next to the solar arrays. So we don't have to deal with that power beaming. Um, everything is located very close together. So in this case, um, uh, we worked with Honeybee Robotics um, uh, to design a pneumatic system that would actually pneumatically collect regolith. Um, that would then be heated to extract the volatiles. And then ultimately it would go through the same process of purification, electrolysis, liquefaction, and storage. So that's option two. And then option three has now moved out of the PSR to what we're calling a PLR, a persistently lit region. And you'll see that our um, excavation is now done in a green area. So if we go all the way back to that other slide, green is an area that has 1% water ice found down a little bit deeper versus in the PSR where you get 2% at a, at a shallower depth. So in this case now, we have to go and we have to um, collect more regolith to get the same amount of water ice, but we're not dealing with PSR all the time. Uh, we, we don't have to deal with a place that is permanently shadowed all of the time. So there's advantages and there's disadvantages to that. So in this case, we had a system of uh, rovers that would actually go extract the volatiles in situ. They would then have to drive back to the base for the purification and uh, uh, electrolysis and liquefaction steps. So you'll see that there's different architectures here. And again, these aren't meant to be definitive, but to kind of illustrate some of the trade-offs that we have in terms of where do you locate things and what battles do you choose, right? Do you, do you, do you go to where there's a good resource, but it's hard to get to, or do you go to a place where the resource is not as, uh, high concentration, but it's an easier place to access. Okay, so let's talk about scale. Um, I think it's important to kind of uh, talk about what the scale of an operation like this would have to be, again, in round numbers. Um, so given our need for four flights of our lander per year, um, each of those requires about 40,000 kilograms of propellant. Again, it's, it's, it's a big system to, to carry that much mass. Um, that means you need a little over 50,000 kilograms of water because we, we have a different engine ratio that, to the natural ratio of water. Um, so that means we need about 1,100 kilograms per day of water, assuming that we operate at half time, which was just an assumption that we made, that we weren't going to be able to operate this, this infrastructure 100% um, of the time. Um, that's about one twelfth of an Olympic-sized swimming pool. Um, you know, for, for a terrestrial operation, that's very small. For, for a space operation, that's enormous. <laughs> that, that is very challenging. Um, given how much water is in the regolith, we can then derive how much regolith we need. Um, so it depends on the different regions. You know, if you have more concentration of water, you need less regolith, of course. Um, but that means you're looking at between 200 to 600 kilograms of regolith just to get one kilogram of water. And that works out to... Um, about 240 uh, tons of regolith per day to 680 tons, depending on the concentration of the resource. That's between 350 and 1,000 pickup trucks. Again, from a terrestrial operation standpoint, not very large. For a space operation, it's unprecedented. Um, so we definitely need to kind of think about the scale of this. I'm not saying these numbers couldn't be a bit smaller, but it's kind of of this scale. <laughs> um, and we do need to realize that it's very large. So what about power? Um, I thought an interesting result of this study was that um, when it comes to the amount of power required for a base like this, um, if you look at this pie chart here, it splits up um, relative energy needs across the different um, elements. And you'll see here that the liquefaction, electrolysis, and extraction of the resource takes up about 75%. Um, you know, that is kind of just the physics of how you have to do uh, electrolysis and, you know, we're making rocket propellant. So the only way to make something that has very high energy when you combine those two things together to be a rocket propellant is to put a lot of energy in to split them up. Um, it takes a lot of energy to do electrolysis and then liquefaction. Um, so an interesting result of this was the fact that, you know, really the ISRU is, is the driving factor. And unfortunately, it's hard to change those numbers. Um, you know, I think that we could look at technologies to make some of these things more energy efficient. But again, it's, it's kind of the physics of the problem, having to split water. Um, so we ended up determining that by the time it's all said and done, you're probably looking at a, over a megawatt of power required for this base. Um, and you'll see in the next chart um, a little bit more detail on that. So here's some early modeling results um, 
for those three options that I specified. Um, the left uh, plot is average base power needs. The right plot is landed mass. So we'll start at the top. So the top is option one. So that's where everything is down in the PSR except for the solar arrays. And the, the biggest thing that made this very challenging were these energy losses, that big light blue box. That's the energy losses due to the laser power beaming. So with laser power beaming, you're taking in sunlight, you're converting it to electricity. You're converting electricity to light again in the form of a laser. And then you're converting light back to electricity. It's a very inefficient process, unfortunately. Um, at least with the current technology that we have. Oh, there's the lights again, speaking of energy. So that was a big driver in needing more solar arrays. And then that became a driver on the mass, if you look over on the right plot. Um, in the left plot, when we were able to take the electrolysis and the liquefaction, those really energy intensive things, and move them out of the permanently shadowed region so that they could be right next to the solar rays and we don't have to deal with the losses from power beaming, we're able to shrink the mass and the mass of the uh, base down and the required power. Now, the challenge there is that from a traverse standpoint, now we have to traverse in and out of the permanently shadowed region. So there's your, once again, you're kind of choosing your battles. What's the hardest thing you have to deal with? In the third um, option, this was where um, power wasn't so much of a challenge because again, we weren't dealing with, with shadowed regions that were permanently shadowed. But because we have that lower concentration resource in the persistently lit regions, we need a much larger um, energy and uh, mass for our ISRU equipment. So this is just to illustrate kind of some of the main things here. You know, of course, you want to be, you want to have the best resource possible down in the PSR, but you also have to think about the other things like, well, how am I going to get power down there? And again, it's all about choosing your battles. What is the most optimal in the end? So just as a quick summary here, um, uh, you know, so the, the purpose of this study was to kind of take a look at the architectural overall base element uh, types that we would be that would be needed for something like this. Um, you know, we we wanted to really emphasize the importance of the systems thinking, holistic design of the base, and also the fact that you know robots are going to be critical here. Um, you know, humans are an important part of it, but we're we're not going to have astronauts that can go and build this. Uh, with their own two hands. Really, the robots are going to have to be really important here. Um, we tried to showcase some interesting new element designs, like the pneumatic excavator, kind of new ways of thinking that might that might be a really efficient way to collect resources. Um, we really wanted to demonstrate the importance of the, the quantitative systems modeling um, to kind of start to take a look at what is most efficient in terms of uh, quantitative parameters like, like mass and power. Um, and finally, I just wanted to note, you know, none of this was meant to be set in stone. Um, really, the, the purpose here is to kind of set some thinking and, and be a guide and kind of an intro so that, you know, when we have discussions like are going to happen in this workshop, we're kind of all on the same page about the types of things that we should be thinking about. So thank you very much. Um, I, I really appreciate the, the invite um, and uh, uh, being able to share this with you all. Um, and I hope there's a really great discussion for the, for the rest of the workshop. Thank you, Alex. Uh, we have a couple, and I want to encourage everybody, please. Oh, let me cut my camera on. Please put your questions in the Q and A. I, I know sometimes that gets confusing on the webinar platform where there's the chat and the Q and A. So if you put them in the Q and A, that would be really helpful. Um, there are a couple questions in there, Alex. I don't know if you can see them. Would you? I can read them to you if that's a little easier. Um, I was able to open them up, so I can sure okay. I can go through. Um, go for it. Okay. So the first question was why focus on water ice instead of regolith for propellant? Um, so the, we do have to collect regolith. Um, uh, it's just, uh, you know, we have to get some kind of resource out of that regolith. Um, and in that case, we, there's different resources that you could extract from the regolith. Um, we focused on water ice, um, given all of the interest in that, you know, we wanted to kind of try to quantify what that might look like, given the interest in the water ice that, that we expect to be there. Um, and also it is a very efficient propellant, you know, liquid oxygen, liquid hydrogen is a very high specific impulse. Um, so we focused on that, at least in this initial study. Um, but, you know, the 1989 study for RLSO2, that focused on using ilmenite uh, within the regolith. So there are different ways to, to do the in-situ resource utilization. Um, is there any mitigation concept for the robotic arms and end effectors on the gantry? 
Um, I'm not sure I understand what you mean by mitigation. Um, uh, I will just say that, you know, in, in general, I, again, the idea with this uh, study was not to design in an exhaustive detail every element, but to identify the types of elements that would be needed. You know, the gantry represents a very multifunctional um, system that can perform many tasks. And exactly how that's implemented, I think, is still an open question. But we wanted to highlight those types of elements that would be needed. Um, let's see, the next question is, can the landers not be launched, landed, making use of beam power? Um, uh, to, to do landing on the moon, uh, you really need a very high thrust system. Um, you know, you might be able to do an electric propulsion system using beam power, um, but that's a very low thrust, um, and we really need a high thrust system for a, for a lunar landing. Um, let's see, the next question, um, have you started to do a parametric estimate of the size, mass, volume of the hardware to do the electrolysis? Um, we, we did. Um, uh, I, you know, I, I'm, I'm going to be honest, I don't remember the exact size. It, um, the the uh, purification system and the electrolysis system was integrated into one unit. It was sized to be able to be launched on a commercial rocket with a four meter fairing. So it's about a four meter diameter. Um, it's in the couple of thousand kilograms. Um, and each of those units actually had three systems. We needed two so that one could fail. Um, so it's a fairly large, you know, thing that has to be in place um, to, to perform those functions. Um, is power beaming a developed enough technology to be efficient? Um, power beaming is, I mean, it's a very new technology. I know there's a lot of work on it. Um, I would advocate that it continues to be looked at, but also with an understanding that, you know, unfortunately the physics of uh, light to electricity to light to electricity is, is hard to make very efficient. Um, so that definitely requires more work. Um, let's see, in what ways Starship changes these architectures thinking? Um, you know, so this was, we did not consider in detail, um, you know, type of things like Starship. Um, I think it, uh, potentially is an important element of this. Um, I don't believe that Starship uses oxygen and hydrogen. So there's a question of, you still have to bring things from earth. Um, but I think that the uh, you know, what, what U.S. industry is working on right now is really exciting and should definitely be fed into things like this and these types of studies. Um, do I have time to keep going? Uh, yes. Okay. We were selfish with the beginning, so you have five. No, 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 no worries. No worries. <laughs> um, uh, let's see. Uh, pneumatic excavation is good for removing regolith overburden, but not so good for mining ice. Um, uh, that's a great question. So, our assumption, and again, it's an assumption until we get more ground truth data, was that the uh, the water ice resource was kind of uh, described it as like coffee grounds and sugar. Um, the regolith are the coffee grounds, and then you have some some little pieces of sugar mixed into those coffee grounds, and it's a fairly loose mixture. Um, and for that reason, we're able to excavate using different methods and kind of pick up that loose mixture. Um, make sure that we don't lose the volatiles by, by jostling them around and then actually extract, you know, the sugar out of the coffee grounds. Um, but that's, I mean, that's, that's an assumption. We definitely need more ground truth data around what that uh, um, uh, regular thin in water ice, uh, uh, what kind of form it is in. Uh, let's see, what purification technologies? Um, so uh, we tried to adapt some commercial purification systems. Um, uh, we had a, an RO system as well as a set of filters. Um, that was all part of the, uh, that, that system I described that was about a four meter diameter kind of module that had both the purification and the electrolysis built in. Um, but those were mostly based on terrestrial applications. Um, there's definitely work that needs to be done on how that would be adapted to a lunar environment. Um, is there any power resource in the considered design other than solar? Um, we did consider other um, options uh, for power. Um, so specifically, I'll mention uh, 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 nuclear reactor technology that I know there's a lot of work on. Um, what we ended up struggling with was the amount of power needed for the base. You know, uh, we were in megawatt class 
to, to be able to perform the ISRU that, that we needed. Um, you know, the, the technology that is kind of most far along for, for, for nuclear power is kind of more in the kilowatt class. We did identify that it might be useful as kind of an emergency backup power. Um, but that being said, you know, the, the result of this study is that maybe we should be thinking about megawatt class nuclear power systems. Um, again, we didn't want to make any final decisions here. It was just to inform kind of what we should be working on. Uh, wouldn't it be cheaper to ship water from Earth? Uh, so um, one thing that we didn't do as part of this study, um, we did not do an exhaustive economic analysis. Um, the intention of this study was to take a, a technical view and really kind of show how this might be done efficiently, what the scale of it would have to be. And we didn't take on as part of this effort an exhaustive economic analysis to say, you know, whether it would be cost efficient or not. Um, I think that that is an important step. Um, and uh, you know, now that we kind of have an idea of what the scale might have to be, we don't want to forget about that economic component, which is so important. Okay, Alex, let's take one more, and then I think we maybe get you to answer those uh, kind of in the tool, in the Q&A part uh, okay. while we take a little break. Sure. Um, so there's one more question here um, uh, from Carl. Um, are there any ways to decrease power requirements, maybe using direct solar heating to extract the water? Um, we did consider that. Um, I, I think that there, that's something that can definitely be considered. Um, we thought about ways that, you know, rather than solar rays, you would have some kind of solar magnification system that would allow us to, to, to not have so much power. Um, from a mass perspective, you know, you still need a, a big thing that can collect light. Um, I think the question is just whether that's more efficient to go right from light to heat versus light to electricity to heat. Um, we didn't go into a lot of detail on that, but I think it's definitely something to consider. Okay. All right. Thank you very much. And I think there's a couple, if you had a chance over in the comments that didn't make it over to the Q&A too, if you can answer those questions. Okay, sure. Guys, thank you. We, thank you very much, Alex. That was very helpful about getting us all on the same page and setting us up for the rest of the discussion.